going to have you join me in the reading of Scripture. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, reading some familiar words of Christ. So read this together with me, if you would. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Amen. We worship the Lord together. We read the Word together. We worship in the hearing of the sermon together. All of that is together, and I'm holding things down. There we go. <laughs> We're going to dismiss for commotion while we can, before I forget, because I'm apt to do so. And I'm going to have you navigate in your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. And if that, I did say 1 Peter, uh, if that surprises you, then, uh, then you haven't been here yet for the last couple of weeks. Uh, even, uh, even for Easter and Good Friday, we found a way to get into Peter's life. So I guess we're a, I guess we're a one focus show uh, this, this season, right? Peter serves as a great example to us, uh, and he serves as a great teacher, and he serves as a good demonstration of the abundant grace of Christ as well. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then uh, we will dig into what God has to say to us today from Peter's first letter to the churches scattered abroad. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. I pray that today you will indeed continue to teach us, to rebuke us, to train us, to make us who you want us to be. We ask you, Father, for your abundant grace to be displayed. And I pray that now my voice will be filled with your words, and that the things that I've written and studied that are of my own fabrication will get ignored and forgotten and left behind, but that your word, your Holy Spirit, will bring your word to the forefront. Father, this is your church. These are your saints. Create in them the holiness that you've already given them in Christ, we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, our King, we all say, Amen. You ever notice that sometimes it's hard to get people to listen? But it's not very hard to get them to look. People are always watching. People will always see more than they will hear in your life. Matter of fact, what you do will often inexplicably override what you say. <laughs> There's no room for uh, do what I say, not what I do. Yeah, it should be the other way around, right? Do what I do, and hopefully you'll also catch what I say, which I guess means that we've got to do. Mm. You know, there is an aspect of the Christian life that does revolve around being good, but listen, we need to draw a distinction. It's an important distinction to be made. We are called to good moral behavior, not in order to obtain salvation. You are not called to good morality in order to obtain salvation. Moreover, 
You are not called to be a good moral people in order to keep the salvation that Christ has given to you. Salvation is, according to the scriptures, not according to Tom Black, the salvation that we gain in Christ is through faith. If you keep faith, you are eternally secure. Let's just leave it in them blankets and we can deal with that tussle another time. So what's the point of good morality? Why would I stand up here ever and say, be good? It's not to earn salvation. It's not to keep salvation. Well, there's a couple of different aspects. One of those we're not going to get in today is that, you know what? God has made you holy, so act like it, right? This, that's, that's, that's one aspect of it, okay? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood washes over every believer in Jesus Christ, and every believer is made holy. You are infused with, you are injected with the holiness of Jesus. Jesus' holiness is applied to you. Book of Hebrews, you know, we, we see God, or rather, turn that around. God sees us through Jesus-colored glasses. So when he sees a believer in Christ. He sees the fullness of the holiness of Christ, okay? So act like it. I mean, that's, that's one aspect we're not going to get into much today, so now I'm delivering it. You've been made holy. Do it, okay? So the second aspect of that, though, really is titled up there <laughs> in the sermon. <laughs> Your life tells a story to everybody who won't listen. Listen, we live in a culture that doesn't want to hear the gospel right now. That is not new. For the last 2,000 years, people have not wanted to hear the gospel. We're not living in times that are morally worse in some way than any other time in human history. Human history, from the very beginning, I don't know, four minutes after Adam and Eve ate an apple or a pomegranate or whatever it was, you know? Pomegranates, because I hate pomegranates. But um, it's just me. I don't, you know, whatever. If you like pomegranates, God bless you. You probably need help. But, uh, but, but you know, four minutes after that, ever since... If we waited four minutes, ever since, humanity has been a train wreck. People don't want to surrender self to the obedience of Christ. So we're not living in unique days where people don't want to hear the gospel, but we're living in the same days that people have always lived in, and Peter's going to touch on it. We live in a culture that doesn't want to hear the gospel, so show it to them. With a couple of different results, right? It's hard to get people to listen, but it's not hard to notice that they are watching. Your life tells a story. Honesty time. Don't answer me. Answer yourself in your heart. Answer God this question. What story does my life tell? Write it down. Put it on a sticky note on your mirror. <laughs> Challenge yourself in the morning. What story does my life tell? Imagine if you could this. You're an American citizen. That's easy, right? You're an American citizen. You, several years ago, moved to Russia. You're living in Russia today, and you find that your relationships are suddenly very strained. And you do not fit in. But live there you do, and work there you must. Russia is engaged in an unjust evil war against the Ukrainian people. We all know this. I don't think it takes a moral genius to figure it out. But they're proclaiming it not only as good, but morally righteous as well. So obviously they're at a point where some people were going to call their behavior evil and some people are going to call their behavior good and we have a, a moral take on the issue. There is a moral aspect to every war. Now, you live there, you work there, you have no power to change Russian politics. Hmm. You don't have the influence to really dramatically change the lives of any of your Russian friends nor of the family all of whom you actually love, even though you have very different perspectives on reality. Your mere identity and the difference with your fellows is beginning to strain the relationships around you to the breaking point because you do not fit in and you cannot simply leave. You are tasked with going about your daily life in such a way as to draw no unnecessary disrepute upon the United States, upon yourself, not to foolishly draw yourself into a conflict you cannot win, and really winning doesn't even look like something we recognize. You're surrounded by a reality that you don't belong there, and what is more, you are continually uncertain whether or not you will survive, much less thrive in a contentious environment you find yourself in. Your best hope, it seems, living in Russia, it is to live in such a way that maybe, against the odds, perhaps some of those who have grown to despise you will renounce their thinking and choose to seek citizenship in your country. Welcome to the Christian church. 
You don't belong here. We live in a culture that does not think, act, believe, or act, or I already said that, the way we do. They don't have the same moral foundation. They don't have the same moral boundaries. And quite frankly, if you're a Christian, you've been made holy, act like it, you not only don't fit in, you're just a weird fish. And we're never, ever going to argue anybody into a different moral perspective without first loving somebody into a different moral foundation in Christ. The illustration kind of breaks down a little bit, but at the heart of it, this struggle of kingdom in conflict. And here's something for us to remember. As long as we are here on this earth, as long as we are here, we are here to share the good news about Jesus. Not everybody wants to listen, but they will watch the way you live. What you do demonstrates what you believe more than what you say. Man, these are refrigerator magnets, aren't they? I mean, those are, those are things that you can, bumper stickers on your car, refrigerator magnets. I mean, these are t-shirt slogans. But it's, the reality is there. So do good and be good with the hope, against hope, that some who would make themselves your enemy might even be saved. And doing that requires that you understand that you are not free to serve your own selfish desires. So here we are, 1 Peter chapter 2. Grab a hold of your Bible if you haven't already and flip the pages or tap the screen. We're in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And let's take a read at those two texts, those two verses together. I think I've got them up there. Beloved, important word, by the way. This is not merely a, 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 a nice dear you, you know. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul personal aspect to this. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, sometimes you say something and, and after you've written it and you've said it, you realize that is kind of goofy. But uh, these two verses are the beginning of the rest of the letter. Yeah, that sounded a whole lot more clever when I wrote it the first time. But, but, but this is kind of where the letter shifts. The letter of 1 Peter, just like almost every New Testament letter, kind of shifts from here's a moral reality, here's a theological reality, sorry, here's a theological reality, you need to learn this, here's the theology, and once you have the theology, you have something to stand on that launches into good behavior. The Bible never just says, go do something without telling you why the something is there, okay? Uh, and, and, and this kind of extends all the way through the rest of the book, dealing uh, with the Christian response to suffering as a result of our faith, and it separates us from the world around us. We've spent time learning about our new identity, the first part of 1 Peter chapter 2, right? Dealing verses 3 through 10. Everything that follows flows out of that reality, and it's spelled out in the first two chapters. Theology and truth are forming the foundation for the ethical commands of Scripture. The Bible does not say, do this and not that, without also telling us the reason. So, there's a good idea. Learn why, and then you'll know what, <laughs> right? Learn why, and then you'll know what. These verses start a smaller section also. You'll notice if you read through there, there's, there's a couple of words that get repeated in there, be subject, be subject, be subject, of submission to various aspects of authority. And so, we're going to have to wrestle with this. But let's start with really the first main point here, looking at verse 11, and that is that your relationships in Christ are vital to your survival. Your relationships in Christ are vital to your survival. Verse 11, Peter begins by calling them beloved. He doesn't just say, hey, you. It's important. Why does he switch there? Why does he call them beloved? And why does he, why, why does he build this relationship into what he's about to say? Well, because he has a real relationship with these people. <laughs> he's not artificially inserting something in there so that well, they'll feel good if they read this word. But that's not his point. He has a real relationship with the people that he's writing to. That's why he's writing them a letter. He's investing in their lives. Are you investing in people's lives? I'm just not really a, a part of here, but I just want to challenge you because this is important. Are you spending time with people on purpose in order to demonstrate the love of Jesus? Now, there's two different types of people that we need to think about that. We, we definitely need to spend time with other Christians in order to show them the love of Jesus. We really need to do that. But you know, we also need to spend time with people who do not yet love Jesus in order to show them the love of Christ. How can they see our lives if our lives never touch theirs? One of the greatest challenges, one of the greatest difficulties I've had as a pastor is that in the last, easily the last couple of decades, 
Um, all of my friends, unless I'm extremely intentional about it, all of my friends are Christians. Which, you know, sounds kind of nice and insulating and keeps me safe and happy and all that. But you know what? If all of my friends are Christians, then none of my non-Christian friends are going to get saved because I haven't got any. <laughs> so one of the difficulties we have is bringing a life that's authentically lived for Christ up against the lives of others. Ooh, walk right off the stage there. For emphasis, right? It doesn't say do that in my notes, so I must be doing something wrong. Here, here's one of the, you know, last week we had some questions in our small group uh, curricula dealing with church discipline. Ooh, everybody's favorite not topic, right? And that highlights the power of relationships in the church. If you're a Christian and you're no longer like the world, the worst thing that can happen to a believer, the worst thing that can happen to a believer's faith when they refuse to repent is to be isolated from the body of fellowship that strengthens and secures that faith. Because this body is supposed to be the place where you fit in. It is supposed to be the place you find strength. It is supposed to be the place you learn to walk in holiness with God. And once you sin so grievously and unrepentantly that you refuse to listen to anybody else and you are therefore treated like an unbeliever and you become a part of the mission field. By the way, when you treat somebody like an unbeliever, it doesn't mean you kick them to the curb and say, I don't like you. It means you have suddenly become the mission field. Clearly, Christ is not active in your life and soul. I need to reach into your life and soul with Christ. That changes things. Church discipline isn't about booting people out because we don't like them. It's putting them in their place so that we can reach them. Wow. Do you love somebody enough to discipline them when it's clear that their faith may not actually be present after all. We're not talking about people who just mess up once in a while. We all mess up, probably more than once in a while. But we're talking about somebody who's hardened into sin and has no desire to walk away from that sin and to walk in obedience with Christ. I'm not talking about somebody who struggles with sin and keeps trying to come back to Christ and then slips again and then tries to come back to Christ and then slips again. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who's hardened into sin and says, I'm not going to listen to the church. Folks, that's where church discipline comes in. And because the church is designed to be this place where our faith grows as we come together, putting somebody outside of that fellowship and saying, we're no longer going to let you feed our faith because you don't have any. We're going to try and build your faith because you don't have any. Making somebody a mission field isn't the unloving thing. It is actually the most loving thing a church can do. This body, this church is supposed to be the one place where you actually fit in in this world. And if you feel like that's not necessarily the case, I need to hear about it, and I need to hear about it now so I can charge work on fixing it. That's one of my jobs, <laughs> and I take it seriously. But Peter begins to urge his friends, his beloved, his readers, his hearers, Based upon the relationship we have in Jesus and the love that we have for one another, Peter says, I've got a job for you. I, I'm urging you something. And the word there is, is fun. You might have, and the only reason I'm going to share the Greek word is not because I'm showing off, is parakaleo. You might have heard the Holy Spirit called the paraclete. Okay? It's very similar sounding words, and there's something to be made out of that, not a whole lot. But the idea of, of parakaleo is coming alongside of somebody, not yelling at them from a distance, coming alongside of somebody, almost like you're putting your arm around them and saying, let's go this way. Okay? And that's what Peter is saying to his friends. That's what Peter, uh, John, in the Gospel of John, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, puts his arm around you, and urges you in the direction of obedience to Christ. And so Peter's saying, you know, look, this is, this is what we do as Christians. We urge one another on in holiness. We intentionally, we intentionally get it up in each other's face sometimes in order to help one another become holy. Now, I'm tempted to take a poll here. I'm resisting the urge. How many of you just love it when somebody gets up in your face? Oh, yeah, I want to raise a hand here. When somebody, I want to do it. Nobody, why is nobody answering that question? <laughs> okay, new question. How many of you like to just get up in somebody else's face? Uh, some of you are like thinking, I want to raise my hand, but I'm not going to do it, right? <laughs> For the few honest folks in the room, I love you. I just want to know... <laughs> I love the rest of you too, but it's just, it's just a different kind of love now. Uh, <laughs> this urging, this, this opportunity to get invested in one another's lives, it's, it's almost a mandate in Scripture. 
It's one that involves us not necessarily being rude to one another, but it's just one of those things that naturally happens when you spend time with one another. That's one of the reasons why we keep saying things like, you got to get in small groups, or you got to come to the Sunday fellowship dinner, you got to, because the time we spend together is the opportunity for our lives to touch. And the time you spend with people is what builds the relationships with the people around you. No time, no relationship. More time, more relationship. It's a simple equation. And by the way, free, not in part of the sermon. Husbands and wives, if you feel like you're mar- feel like, if you feel like your marriage is drifting apart, it's not where it used to be, spend more time together. Find ways to do it. Help him change the oil. If you have no idea what an oil wrench looks like, go out there and watch. Do something together. Husbands, do the dishes dry while your wife is washing. If that's what's going to do, spend time together and your marriage will grow stronger. It's not part of the sermon, but man, it's a part of life. It's maintenance. And it's fun maintenance after a while. Things get really good there. Moving on into the text here. Peter's saying something to his friends. He says, come then, he says, it's almost like this. I come then, I'm urging you as a friend, as a pastor, as a guide, who is a fellow traveler. Let's journey together as those who don't belong here and thrust all of our effort behind this walk of holiness for the sake of the gospel in our own life and the lives of unbelievers. Listen to that last phrase as I kind of paraphrased Peter's thinking, as we put our effort behind the walk of holiness for the sake of the gospel, listen, both in our own life and in the lives of unbelievers. Christian, you need the gospel. Not because you've never heard it, not because you've never been saved, not because you're not redeemed, not because you're trying to keep picking this gospel thing back up, but because you need to hear it. You need to have your faith continually strengthened every day all of the time. Why? Because every aspect of this world is trying to pull it out of your fingers. Come to think of it, it's not just the world, is it? Sometimes we're doing it ourselves. And that's the language that Peter is going to use as he walks through here. Let's see what he says. He talks about calling us sojourners and exiles. Sojourners and exiles. He reminds them Uh, where this letter started, chapter 1, verses uh, 1 and 17, he talks about us being exiles. An exile is somebody who doesn't belong where they live. A sojourner is somebody who is a citizen of a different country who's currently living in another country. It's you at the beginning of the story, an American citizen living in Russia. That's a sojourner, somebody who doesn't belong where they live and who actually belongs somewhere else. Listen, you belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, not even to the kingdom of the United States. If this was any closer to July 4th, I'd probably get stoned for saying that. I'm a patriot. I love my country. But Jesus is my king, and there is no other. Everything about this country is second to Christ. And that is true whether you happen to be a Somalian citizen, an American citizen, a Russian citizen, Egyptian citizen. Christ is over every nation every tribe, and every tongue, which makes us not fit in. And those first century Christians who were supposed to prove their citizenship by taking a pinch of incense and throwing it on the altar and proclaiming, Caesar is Lord, wouldn't do it. And so they were called disturbers of the peace. They were called atheists because they wouldn't worship Caesar as a god. They were called atheists because they wouldn't worship Jupiter or, or whatever the other Roman gods were. I don't, right now, can't do it. Our identity, though, is of a people who belong to God and to his kingdom. We don't belong here. And we, once we get that into our hearts and minds, the rest of this letter just kind of falls into place. Because believers belong to God, we are both relationally and morally separated from this world, and we will never fit in here. Pastor, I think you've preached essentially that same message for the last, like, five months. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, there's something about we've got to figure out that we don't belong here before we can figure out how to live where we belong. The moment we become a Christian, we become an exile. But we're not hidden away in a cloister. We're exposed to watching world. And they're all watching to see, do they really believe what they say they believe We read this earlier, Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out 
and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do you see the exact same language being used from Jesus and Peter? (laughs) So that they can give glory to your Father in heaven. What kind of light would a dirty lamp give off? A sullied light. A darkened light. It would be a light barely distinguishable from the darkness. And that's the problem. We've got too many of us as Christians... that want to have both feet firmly planted in heaven and both feet firmly planted on the earth. I gotta tell you, we're gonna have to let one go or the other. We're not designed to live with one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. We're not designed to live as if we're grabbing all the gusto this life has to offer. We're supposed to be living as if we're grabbing all the gusto that life has to offer. And if it costs us in this life, oh well. If we're here for 100 years, what does that even compare? to the millions in the presence of Christ. And it's not like, well, you know, I'll just get everything I can this time and then I'll enjoy the rest then. (laughs) You know what? God might give you much. He might not give you much. But it's not about the accumulation and it's not about the self-glorification. It's not even about our own comfort. It's about pursuing him and trying to do everything we can to help somebody else pursue him that isn't yet pursuing him. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Your lifestyle matters for your survival. Your faith. Faith is a fragile thing. Faith is a, I don't want to call it a tenuous thing because it's upholded by the power of God Almighty. In fact, one of the, one of the lessons from our small group this coming week <laughs> involves uh, the nature of saving faith as it's written in the Baptist Catechism. And I've given you some steady questions for that. But the reality of saving faith is that it comes from God. It's upheld by God but it's walked in by us. Here's the deal. If you put your shoes on in the morning and you don't tie them, throughout the day, what's going to happen? You're going to end up getting blisters, maybe tripping, maybe falling, maybe walking right out of your shoes if you're in a particular hurry. This breaks down really, really badly, so don't read too much into it, but our faith can be like untied shoes if we don't grab hold of it and make it our own. It's going to cause friction. It's going to cause pain in our lives. In fact, we're going to experience pains that we don't need to experience if we don't walk in the faith that Christ has called us to walk in. In fact, we're going to find all kinds of problems if we don't make our walk, our faith, our living with Jesus the first and foremost item on our daily calendar, so to speak. Your lifestyle matters for your survival. Peter is urging us towards this. He says, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Now, I don't know about you, but my first question when I, when I read that, and I thought, okay, what, what, what are they? <laughs> what are the passions of the flesh? I mean, I'd like to, okay, abstain from what? Give me a list. The good news is there's lists all over Scripture. You will study them this week in small group. But, but, he doesn't give us a list. Why do you think Peter doesn't give us a list? Abstain from these particular passions which wage war against your soul. Because the things he might put on his paper wouldn't be the things on your paper. (laughs) You know what it is that distracts you the most from Christ. You know what it is that draws you further away from faith. And I'll bet you it's different from the things that would threaten to draw me further away from Christ. So if Peter were to give us a list, we could look at that list, half of us, and go, it's not me, I got no problems, not realizing that we got problems. So he says, abstain from these things. By the way, abstain? Abstention requires a sacrifice because you don't abstain from something you don't want. Uh, Nobody has to encourage me not to drink a tuna fish milkshake. Mmm, yummy. (laughs) However, if you were to have a chocolate chip mint raspberry milkshake, it might take a little work to get me to not pick it up. You know what I'm saying? Because that's something I crave. Tuna fish, not so much. (laughs) Abstain from those things that draw you hungrily away from Christ. Yeah, sometimes the answer is don't do it. (laughs) But there's a reason, because there is so much at stake. 
The call to abstain given by Peter reminds us that the price to be paid by indulging is higher than perhaps we realize or understand. The more we indulge the flesh, the farther we walk from Christ. What does Peter mean by the flesh? Well, we could talk about the meat and skin, the bones, you know, that you came with, right? We could talk about that, but there's more to it than that. It's also the thinking, the way we are, the, the being that we have, the passions and the cravings for sin that we typically feel throughout any aspect of our life. In the New Testament, the word flesh is usually used to describe the sinful aspects of physical, emotional, and spiritual desires that are contrary to righteous living. That's kind of a broad statement, and they are all over Scripture. And so maybe I'll just give you one passage. How about Romans 6.19? He starts out saying, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. He says, but just as you once used to be, before you were Christians, you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. In other words, what you're supposed to be passionate about is walking closer with Christ. If you're passionate about something else, you probably need to do a double check. Double check. One more passage, Romans 8.8. 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm going to stop right there because there's enough in the verse to keep us going, but those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And he's got this potentially huge list, you know, that you can draw in other places of scriptures. For example, Galatians and others, you know, sexual impurity or, or gluttony or fits of rage or dabbling in the occult, you know, reading the horoscopes, energies, crystals, and that kind of garbage. That stuff is acts and deeds of the flesh. There's so much more. I've got a whole bunch of passages here that uh, I'm going to encourage you to read this week. Let me just send you to Galatians 5, 16 to 24. If you don't read any others, go Galatians 5, 16 and read all of the footnoted verses that are connected to that in your Bible, okay? So we can, uh, we can do that. The list is incomplete, though. But this list, this sinful desires that we have in our flesh, they war, war against your soul. War is a unique word, <laughs> A war is not a battle. A war is an ongoing sequence of multiple battles in multiple places in order to achieve a victory. And sin is at war with you. The things that you desire in this world that draw you away from Christ, they are trying to destroy your faith, ultimately, so that you walk away from Christ. Moreover, I think as one commentator that I read this week, I think accurately stated, given the context of what Peter is talking about, Here's the biggest one that afflicts afflicts us all. The concept of wanting to be accepted as an equal to this world is probably the biggest trip hazard for all of us. I want to be just like everybody else. In fact, I want everybody else to like me. I mean, if, if, if I have a defining characteristic down deep in my own mind, it's that I want people to like me. I love it when people like me. I don't respond well when people don't like me. I stay up at night. It's like, why don't, why, don't, why don't they like me? What's the matter with me? I'm a nice guy. I, you know, I smile. I brush my teeth once a week. I mean, things are, you know, I, I, mean, I, I go through this list. What are the things that that person doesn't like me about? And I can begin to isolate. And, and... What would change? What would change if the person on that list was Christ? How can I walk more closely with Christ? How can I? Everything changes in relation to that. It is the unrelenting quest of our lives to fit in with comfort, self-protection, and self-gratification that often wage the most war against our soul. Galatians 5.17, it warns us that none of these passions of the flesh are good, but we tolerate them in others or in ourselves because we love sin. And I'm not talking about tolerating them in sinners. Sinners sin, that's what sinners do. I'm talking about tolerating them in Christians because if I try to hold that person accountable for their sin, then that means they might hold me accountable for my sin, and quite frankly, I'd like to avoid that, so I'm not going to call anybody out. You're endangering somebody else's faith walk if you don't love them enough to draw them closer to Christ and farther from sin. But it's not just you. It's others. Do good because it helps your faith grow strong. Stay strong, be strong. But also do good because it might, might 
trigger faith in somebody who doesn't yet believe in Jesus. Your life could make the difference for their salvation. The gospel hope of your daily walk is displayed in verse 12 as a whole. Let's take a look. Read it one more time. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. There's a couple of really weird things going on in this text. It's a surprising passage. Keep your conduct, it's the stuff you do every day, among the Gentiles. Hold up. Okay? Little history lesson. All the way back, Genesis 12, God calls Abraham. Abraham, I'm, I'm going to bless the entire planet through you. Right? Okay? Abraham says, cool. I'll be a party of that. And Abraham has a kid, and he has a kid. And his grandf- Abraham's grandson, Jacob, gets renamed to Israel. He has 12 boys, and that's the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? So there's your history lesson thus far. The Israelites, known as the Jewish people, called themselves Jewish and everybody else a Gentile. So if you were not genetically Jewish, you're a Gentile. I am a Gentile. I don't think I have any Jewish blood. I haven't really looked. But I am a Gentile. The chances of most of us in this room being a Gentile, extremely high. Peter is writing to genetically Jews who believe in Jesus and genetic Gentiles who believe in Jesus. But he has this really weird phrase. (laughs) Let your conduct among the Gentiles be honorable. What Peter is doing is he's helping us to recognize the shift in our identity. This is pretty important. There are genetic Jews who believe in Jesus. And there are genetic Jews who don't believe in Jesus. Both, they're all Jewish by blood. But in the Old Testament, God refers to these genetic Jews that believe in him as the remnant. Okay? There are Gentiles who do not, by nature, believe in God and Christ. And there are today, Gentiles, like this, like us, who believe in Jesus. Here's where the rubber hits the road. God does not have a different plan for believing Gentiles and believing Jews. The book of Colossians, the book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians, all three of those, they just come together and they just, and the book of Romans. I mean, it's just all over. Romans 9, 10, and 11. It's all over the place. Believing Jews and believing Gentiles are united together in one body. There is only one church. But what Peter is doing is he's helping us to recognize that we get to participate in the promises that God has made to spiritual Israel because we are, in the words of Romans chapter 11, 10, 9, it's grafted in and have become part of the promises to God's people, Israel. And so he is here alluding to that reality, saying you who believe in Jesus have become spiritual Israel. You have become what God has always desired. Your task is to reach the lost. Let your conduct as spiritual Israel be among the Gentiles something that is honorable. And then he has this pretty tremendous reason for doing that. So that... When they speak against you as evildoers, can I just point out, he does not say if. He doesn't say if. When people who don't believe in Jesus say that you're a bigot, say that you hate people because you disapprove, for example, of homosexuality. You hate gays. No, I don't hate gays, man. I love them enough to want them redeemed. You hate people that have multiple wives. You know, I don't. I just want him to recognize that's not God's plan. And, uh, you know, he wants them redeemed. You hate people who do drugs. Absolutely not, you know. I'm very familiar with the problems that come from that. I would love to draw them out of that and find them some real, actual, living life. I don't hate these people because they're not like me. When they look at your moral stance, you hate women because you're against abortion. No, actually, I love women because I'm pro-life. They see your moral stance and declare you wicked and evil and unloving and unrighteous because you don't match their worldview. 
Congratulations, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. You have arrived at the point of receiving reward because you are unjustly accused. When, when they speak against you as evildoers, here's the goal. I would like nothing more, Peter is saying, than when somebody accuses you of evil, when you're pursuing righteousness, and it's not actually evil, he's going to deal with that too later. Maybe, just maybe, maybe they'll see something in your behavior that will incline them to ask, that will incline them to inquire, that will cause them to not just watch, but to listen to the words of the gospel and receive him. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, if your behavior matches your faith statement, maybe one person will listen to the gospel, receive Christ, and on the day of his coming, will stand side by side with you and proclaim him as king who has come for them as well. That's the desire. That's what he wants. Live such good lives among the Gentiles that when he comes, he may find them praising him for their salvation too. Maybe... You've gotten to this point and you're thinking one of two things. Number one, man, I have messed this up so badly. There is nobody who's going to look at my life right, as it is right now and is going to say, that's a Christian I want to be like. Congratulations, this is an awesome day to repent, to bring that before Christ, even to bring that before your other brothers and sisters in Christ and say, you know what, this is an area where I need help and prayer and accountability and challenges and a good slap in the face once in a while. Okay, not the last one, okay? Unless you're like me, and you learn slowly. But maybe there's that person that's on your radar that has been dead set against you, and you're just trying. Maybe it's imperfectly, imper imperfectly. You're striving, you're trying, you're struggling to live the Christian life and to be authentic and to be faithful and to love them, and they're just, you don't even know if they're listening, and maybe you want prayer for that person today. I want to invite you to a chance to come up as we sing this last song. And to just invite uh, myself or Trent or, you know, actually any of our deacons, somebody to pray along with you. As we learn to walk together into this realm of living such good lives, that somebody gets one to Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us please. Honestly, I believe a whole lot more of us resonate with the one who says, I'm not sure I'm providing the best example I can possibly provide. Today, right now, God, I'm asking you to change us, to move us into faithfulness, to walk us into obedience, to transform our lives, to, 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 to give us the boldness and the bravery and the strength and the accountability to draw away from the passions of the flesh and to draw towards walking in obedience. So that maybe, just maybe that person who's been watching will be able to praise you on the day of your visitation. Amen.